Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Um, my name is Fernando from Cognity Labs, and we have an exciting program uh, ahead for you guys. We have exciting guest speakers we've invited, and we hope uh, that you guys will uh, learn a lot or take a lot out of our program here today. So our program is titled uh, International Ecosystem Feature Silicon Valley. And uh, as I go on in the presentation, do feel free to uh, type your questions in the comments box, and we will uh, allot a portion at the end of the session to answer your questions. So yeah, do feel free to do that um, even while I'm speaking. So um, uh, before we begin, uh, I'd first like to do a quick introduction on Cognity Labs, uh, which is hosting this session. So Cognity Labs is a virtual startup accelerator that bridges Silicon Valley to emerging markets. And how do we do that? We do that by running an eight-week virtual accelerator program that aims to help founders learn best practices and get support from advisors and mentors who are largely based in Silicon Valley. So we look for pre-seed post-MVP startups. Um, and these early stage startups are, we, we invite them to apply and we choose startups which we believe have the most potential to benefit from our program. And these are the startups we work with through that eight week program. And, and, and during the program, we have uh, a portion where we match these startups with mentors and advisors. And, and these mentors and advisors will not just help the startup through the program, but also post-program and throughout the journey of the startup will be there also to guide the startup. So that's a, a, a big uh, sort of value add that we, we, we want to give these startups who join our program. So we operate in three countries, that's Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Uh, and we have uh, three startups per cohort, per country. So that makes it uh, nine startups in the upcoming cohort. Uh, Cognity Labs started in 2019, operating just in the Philippines, and we started with three startups from there. Our founding team is uh, composed of Earl Valencia, Mika Reyes, and Ping Rivero, all of whom are based in the U.S. and heavily embedded in the U.S. tech scene. Our first cohort uh, last year featured three startups. So that's AdMove, Expensio, and Leila, all from the Philippines. And um, we're happy to, um, we're, we're actually excited to, to await uh, the, the, the nine startups that will be joining us in the upcoming cohort, which will run from January to March in 2021. So there you have it. That's pretty much all for uh, Cognity Labs. Uh, as a quick introduction, do check us out on our website and hit us up on social media uh, and, and, and just watch out for us as we will, for our next cohort in 2021, we will start accepting applications as soon as Q2, Q3 in 2021. So now I'd like to pass the floor on uh, to one of our co-founders, Earl Valencia who will speak more about the contrast between the Southeast Asia and US startup ecosystems. So just a quick intro, um, Earl is a venture advisor for startups and corporate innovation teams. He is based in New York, where he was a managing direct director for digital transformation for a Fortune 500 financial services firm, and previously the program manager for corporate data at Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest hedge fund. Earl co-founded Kubo, the National Innovation Center of the Philippines and Idea Space Foundation. He is an alum of Boston University, Cornell University, and has an MBA from Stanford. So uh, without further ado, I'd, I'd like to pass the floor on to Earl. Perfect, thanks uh, Fernando for the kind introduction and obviously also introducing Cognity Labs. You know, when we uh, conceptualize Cognity Labs, Probably about a year and a half, two years ago, uh, we asked this question, which is, you know, um, how can we bridge, right? Like, how can we bridge uh, the experience of us uh, who, you know, maybe is first or second generation um, Southeast Asian in particular, or I guess people from emerging markets in general, 
um, into like their own home countries uh, because we saw a lot of uh, people asking um, both sides, right? So a lot of entrepreneurs from home countries say, you know, how can we access the networks, the knowledge, uh, and potentially the funding of Silicon Valley? And we also a lot uh, hear a lot from the uh, diaspora in particular to say, you know, how can I help? Um, you know, I'm in, uh, you know, in, in these large tech companies, or I'm a startup founder, I'm a VC. How can I help? But I don't have time. And uh, when we we thought about that, uh, we we you know we just asked, you know, why do you have to uh, physically go, I guess, into a, a startup program in in Silicon Valley in order to access Silicon Valley resources and that's kind of how the concept was. And uh, we're lucky that this year um, we're expanding our program to two other countries um, in uh, Vietnam uh, and uh, Indonesia. And uh, you'll hear from some of our uh, partners, our friends uh, uh, in, in these other uh, places as well as our other venture partners. So, yeah, so, I mean, this is kind of the, the thought process. So for maybe for the first next five, five to seven minutes or so, I'll give you some thoughts um, not very scientific, but at least our own group's thoughts on what are the differences between the different international ecosystems within Southeast Asia and maybe what your observations are in, in Silicon Valley. So I guess if you go to the next uh, slide, Fernando, um, we'll see what, what happens. So again, um, uh, you know, this is really an observation um, of most of us here in the, uh, uh, the, the session kind of shuttling between these two large geographies, right? Like one is the Silicon Valley or I guess New York or the US in general, or maybe other innovation hubs. And then always going back to Southeast Asia and going back and forth and shutting back and forth. And, you know, if you do this often enough, you think of, you know, there's something that's different. There's something that's common. And how can we pick in the best parts of each in order to build potentially global impactful ideas, right? Um, but one thing we also realize is that it's not simple, right? And to be honest, it's not even geography which makes a difference. I think it lays deeper than geography. Um, you know, I know in, in in Southeast Asia, a lot of us have probably some of the best beaches in the world, and thus some of the best weather for beaches. Um, in Silicon Valley, people argue too that you know they have some of the best um, weather, right? Uh, kind of, it's uh, someone told me it's like an air conditioner every day, right? Um, but I guess beyond temperature, beyond geography, um, what is the underlying kind of, um, you know, it could be a culture, uh, what I call it. But uh, well, I'll go to the next slide. And this is kind of my ultimate uh, thoughts here, right? Uh, this question that I ask myself all the time, right? Um, how um, can local and business and in particular, especially family culture, affects one's ability to start a company in a certain city or country. Um, you know, especially for Southeast Asian culture, I mean, me, I'm, uh, you know, I'm from the Philippines. Um, you know, your family circle, you know, is, is impactful to your decision to start a company. Um, you know, what business or industries are in certain countries affects what startups get built. Um, and to be honest, this is kind of, um, also affects where someone thinks their career should be going and their parents think that their kids' career should be going, right? So this is really boggles my mind as I shuttle between a place in like Southeast Asia where, you know, there is really a lot of pressure by families to take the, um, the stable route. And then I go uh, into like Silicon Valley where I see people, you know, betting their lives into an idea um, and sometimes, you know, not even well thought of. Obviously, it's it's interesting, right? And how to see this contrast. Uh, but then, you know, one side gets funded, you know, um, you know, with maybe a uh, idea and a dream, and obviously maybe a prototype. And the other side just needs more metrics. So how and why, right? So this is kind of what I was thinking about. So we'll go to the next slide here, and this is kind of my quick litmus test, right? Um, will you pass? Uh, their mother-in-law test, and I guess for um, you know, for women, will you pass the father-in-law test, right? And it's basically I, I don't know who I got this from. I think it's from uh, Naran Murthy from Infosys when I was in Stanford, and that, that's what he explained. Where um, you know, um, when you go and propose, at least if you're a guy, propose to your uh, to your wife and ask um, for the hand of of your potential uh, wife to be, you ask. Um, 
you know, can I get the, the hand in marriage? And one of the first questions of the mother and father-in-law is, what do you do for a living? <laughs> and if you say something that's wrong, uh, they might have veto power, right? So this is an actual thing that, uh, to be honest, in most of our cultures in Asia probably have. So um, the question is, will you pass this mother-in-law test and the pressures of it, right? So uh, we'll go to the next slide. And um, when, we, when we see, uh, and this is like something that we, we just came up with, it's like what we call a dream career index for local ecosystems. Because we can talk about infrastructure and we talk about startup ecosystems and we talk about like an you know, IP infrastructure and government infrastructure. But very few people um, really recognize that there is this underlying local social pressure uh, for each one, especially founders. So we said, okay, if we create like at least comparison between different ecosystems, what would that be, right? So one is like what part of the global value chain a certain ecosystem is, what are the top industries there? Um, what is the respected profession? Again, this mother-in-law test or father-in-law test. Uh, what are the dream companies typically be college grads? What is the dominant in incentive structures? Um, you know, how people like to get paid, right? Um, what will give you respect? And then the last one is, uh, what is the top question to ask uh, an interviewer? So, um, so yeah, without further ado, uh, this is our attempt. And again, just full disclosure, it's not necessarily scientific, but really our own thoughts and observations between us and the uh, Cognity Labs uh, partnership team. Uh, also talking to some of our friends, right? So maybe we'll go to the next slide, Fernando, which is kind of my last slide here to hopefully set up the panel. Cool. So I know it's a little bit of an eye chart, but I'd love to, you know, uh, share some of our discussions, right? So when we looked and compared and contrast, uh, you know, Silicon Valley to the markets that we operate in, in Cognitive Labs, we look at, you know, these elements that I talked about in the previous slide. And, you know, as we see it here, at least I'll start off first with, you know, uh, I guess, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, where uh, we see that uh, as part of the value chain, if you think about this, like create, capture, um, deliver, and service value, right? So where is the value chain mostly, right? And um, at least in Silicon Valley, we think that that's most of the time, that's kind of where they create novel new products. And then they let, you know, other parts of the value chain take care of, you know, um, you know delivering the value, servicing the value, right? So they create something, uh, that maybe will get consumed later on. Um, top industries, obviously, it's technology. Uh, I had a chart before here, which is like New York, and that's obviously finance, right? Um, what is the respected professions in in the Bay Area? And uh, yeah, I mean, these are some. Um, you know, if you if you talk to some of these uh, tech uh, literati, you you know, people want to say that they say with the pride, right? Like they're engineers, product managers, founders, designers, venture capitalists, right? And they all dream, at least when you go to college, to work for big, big tech of, of, or startups. Uh, but then what's nuanced here is this next one, which is the incentive structure, which is um, really it's equity and stock options. Um, you know, I used to work in Schwab and, uh, you know, we saw a disproportionate amount of people that get paid with equity uh, versus salary uh, compared to, let's say, in Wall Street, where most of the people get their cash bonuses. Um, but what will you get respect is your creativity, innovation and potential. And um, what what I always see is like, what's a good uh, question to ask an interviewer? And, uh, you know, when you're looking for a job and, uh, you know, at least in, in San Francisco, uh, sometimes we ask the interviewer, like, what's the company's mission? And to be honest, not everywhere in the world, um, people ask these questions, right? Um, so Philippines is interesting. So I'll go that next before I go to the Vietnam, Indonesia. I think it's part of the value chain. We're like at the service side. So maybe it's manufacturing, maybe it's, you know, servicing them from a BPO side um, uh, and uh, respected professions. And, you know, I'm sure this is generalizing, but uh, at least when we polled our, our team, you know, still doctors, lawyers and marketing executives, right? So people want to work for big CPGs, as you can kind of see here, CPG retail lifestyle. Um, and yeah, of course, I think you can see in most of Southeast Asia, when you go to graduate from college, they really want this predictable net, not even gross, net monthly salary. Right, uh, they want this predictable income, and you know that's why sometimes when you talk to you know your friends, your peers, your parents, you say, "Is it a stable? Right? Can you go to a stable company?" Um, and uh, you know what gets your respect in some of these areas? It's still, I guess, uh, some of these Asian um, you know um, areas where your family name could matter, your personal network could matter, 
Um, and yeah, and people really, um, you know, really look at, you know, who's, who's their, uh, you know, who's their colleagues, right? So this social culture is very important in the workplace. Uh, next one is Indo. And you can kind of see that they're tracking towards a little bit of this, you know, what's happening in Silicon Valley. And, you know, no, no, no surprise here uh, because of, you know, number of unicorns that happened in, uh, in Indonesia in the past couple of years, right? Uh, you know, from Tokopedia to Gojek, uh, Kalapak, et cetera, right? So even if their value chain is service focused and they're still outsourcing, um, you know, there is still respect right now with, you know, being a factory owner, right? Uh, doctors, lawyers, bank bankers. But when you talk to the college grads, uh, you know, according to our informal research, you know, people actually want to work now in tech companies. They saw the stories of Indonesian building these mega companies, right? And uh, and even if they still want to net uh, a salary, um, they they still want to work maybe for this kind of up and coming companies. Um, despite that, actually, what gets you respect is your family name uh, or personal network. But an interesting thing, uh, I guess, observed is that, you know, people are getting smart, right? They ask, uh, you know, even large companies, they work for these large tech companies, like, who are the investors here? Um, are they, uh, you know, credible or are they kind of backing it up for, you know, further stability, right? Uh, and then the last one really is, uh, you know, in Vietnam. Um, so we kind of see here that they're also in the service chain. Um, they still like, you know, banks and tech companies, very kind of similar, maybe the hybrid between the Philippines and Indonesia. Um, and, you know, I think very similar to all of us, they still want a net monthly salary, uh, personal network. But uh, a big thing also is that who's their boss, right? So um, as we can kind of see here, there's a lot of commonalities. There's a lot of contrasts. So once you go and think about, you know, expanding your team, expanding your product, um, an understanding of these types of changes uh, would be very critical for you either as an investor, as a founder, as an operator expanding into this market. So uh, I'm really hoping that uh, this lays down the foundation for uh, our panel, which uh, I'm super happy that uh, we have this all-star panel that we have. So I'll turn it over back to Fernando to set up the panel, introduce uh, you know, our moderator. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks so much, Earl. That was great. Um, so now um, we, we move on to the panel portion of our session. And let me just give a quick introduction on who will be joining us here today. So uh, first of all, one of our, one of our co-founders, uh, Mika Reyes, will be the one moderating the panel. So just a quick introduction about Mika. Mika is a product manager at LinkedIn Jobs. She previously worked at Kumu and Ripcord. She is most passionate about broadening access through tech in emerging markets. She graduated with a BA in economic psychology data analysis from Wesleyan University and is a proud Philippine Science High School scholar. So uh, let me also introduce uh, our guests uh, joining us here today. I'll start with Brian Ma. So uh, Brian is a three-time founder turned investor. He's now managing partner at Iterative, which invests in early stage companies and runs an accelerator focused on Southeast Asia. Iterative's mission is to fund and build the next unicorns in Southeast Asia. Brian was previously founder at Divi Homes, Weave, and Decide. Um, unfortunately, Tiffany uh, Sudharma uh, cannot join us uh, today, but uh, let me move on over to Dan Gonzalez, uh, also a special guest. Uh, so Dan is a first-generation Filipino-American, born and raised in San Francisco. He is a UC Riverside alumnus. After graduation, he worked in business development in early-stage startups and worked at BU Venture Partners as a venture capital analyst. Currently, Dan is writing a book on entrepreneurship and hosts the Startup Mindsets podcast. And finally, um, uh, also joining the panel to give his uh, take on uh, the Vietnam ecosystem is uh, a, our venture partner from Vietnam, Henry Lee. So Henry is a venture partner at Cognity Labs, managing the Vietnam market. He is an ex-Amazonian with five years of experience in the analytics and big data field. So there you have it. I'll pass the floor on to Mika uh, for the panel session. Uh, Mika.
Thanks, Fernando. Really excited to get started on this panel with an all-star cast. Um, and, and really a topic for, a uh, broad topic for the, the panel discussion um, is along the trends that Earl was talking about, really understanding the differences between the startup ecosystems in Silicon Valley and Southeast Asia, um, and, and have different perspectives here um, to inform that discussion. Um, cool. Uh, some of the questions, let me get started. Um, really curious, uh, Henry, Brian, and Dan. Um, what do you think are, uh, especially for uh, folks who um, understand both ecosystems, um, what are some similar tech trends um, that we've seen um, in Silicon Valley versus Southeast Asia? Do you want to go first, Brian? Or? <laughs> no, no, no. I saw you speak. I saw you. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> Man, you know, that's a, that's a good question. What are some similar tech trends between here and uh, Southeast Asia? Um, I think we're just living in a cult COVID society now. So uh, I know that there's a lot of venture dollars being poured into the U.S. ecosystem, and I've seen the rise also within the Southeast Asian ecosystem. But uh, in terms of like early stage trends, um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think healthcare is gro growing, but I haven't really heard too much healthcare news within the SEA ecosystem. So I think it's just a trend of like growing entrepreneurship. Like people have uh, maybe like uh, stepped away from the corporate life to do their own ventures or um, really just pour, pour back into causes that they, they care about. Um, would love to you know hear more research within the uh, Southeast Asian e ecosystem in terms of uh, what's, what's new and like what's hot, like uh, what's, what's blooming, but uh, don't know too much right now, but um, I guess that's that's what I got to say about you know what's happening between the two parties. Cool. So I heard healthcare uh, similar there, and then there's generally a trend of more folks going into entrepreneurship, more, more folks going into the tech scene uh, in both ecosystems. What about you, Brian? Uh, so quick background: I've spent most of my life in uh, in the U.S. in the Bay Area, um, and so I know way more about that than I do uh, Southeast Asia. So you guys, I'm not the expert here. Uh, so we've been in Southeast Asia for the past um, year and a half now looking at companies. Um, we've probably talked to 500 or 600 companies that have gone through, uh, applied to our accelerator. Um, I would say the way to think about it is um, Southeast Asia is maybe like the Silicon Valley 10 years ago. So the way to look at it is like you're looking at similarities of how the ecosystem developed 10 years ago. So what's hot right now is... Uh, a lot of stuff that's happening in Southeast Asia is um, traditionally very much offline. Uh, and so what you're starting to see is you're starting to see like retail get digitalized, you're starting real estate get digitalized, you're starting to see banking get digitalized. And uh, I think the cool thing that's happening right now is um, everyone for the first time is experiencing the internet on their phones. Uh, <laughs> and uh, like, Messaging is new, e-commerce is new, travel is new, banking is new, et cetera. Uh, and so, yeah, I think the similarities are like um, innovation just like uh, innovation happens. And it's rather than kind of like look at uh, Silicon Valley versus um, uh, Southeast Asia now, we should be looking at kind of like how did the ecosystem develop? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the other thing kind of like not tech trendy uh, is I think uh, the people are pretty similar. Uh, so I think a lot of times people are like, okay, cool, all the like amazing founders are in Silicon Valley. Uh, I think that's, I think Silicon Valley has a lot of density of founders, but in terms of like where people's mindsets are, um, it's like very much ready for, uh, for innovation to happen. Um, and so I went, I don't know, I went a little bit beyond your question, but uh, I think there are a lot of similarities if you look uh, at kind of like how the ecosystem's developing. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that resonates. Um, and uh, I think what was really interesting was um, this mindset uh, of, of more folks being ready to take on that risk to um, be part of the tech ecosystem, which maybe uh, 10 years ago um, uh, was not uh, there yet. Um, cool. Uh, similar question, 
but I'm going to flip it. Uh, maybe it's an easier question. What are some of the different tech trends uh, between uh, Silicon Valley and Southeast Asia? I and mean, some of them uh, we kind of touched on um, earlier, um, but what do we think is diverging um, between these two? I can do this one first. Uh, so I think there's two major differences um, that I've seen. The first one is um, Southeast Asia. I don't know if this is a tech trend, but this is something that most people in the US don't think about. Uh, so Southeast Asia is like at least nine major ecosystems, right? Uh, in terms of like countries. And so cultures are very different. Localization is really different. The way you like um, interact with products is really different. And so for someone, I don't know, moving from the US or even China uh, to like come to Southeast Asia, that's not the first thing they think of, uh, but it's like incredibly important when you start a company. And so I think the methodology of creating uh, startups is like slightly, slightly different. Um, if you talk about tech trends, I think what's most interesting to me is um, in Southeast Asia, uh, or sorry, let's start with the US. In the US, if you go talk to VCs, Likely what uh, VCs are looking for are they're looking for this like hot, new, innovative, kind of like something that nobody has seen before, right? Uh, because the US has built a bunch of kind of like um, infrastructure and ecosystems already around kind of like startups. So I don't know, if you go into FinTech, there's like a thousand FinTech companies working on like something uh, interesting and new. Same thing with e-commerce, same thing with healthcare. Uh, I think what you find in Southeast Asia is the reverse, like the exact opposite, right? Which is um, there, the problems are really, uh, really obvious, right? It's kind of like, I need to buy a plane ticket, right? And it's like really inefficient right now to buy a plane ticket. Or like, I need to, I don't know, get groceries. Uh, and it's like super, super in, uh, inefficient. And so I think the major uh, tech trend differences is, um, in Southeast Asia, you get to build these like very large vertical companies, kind of like the like Travelocas of the world, right? Um, and in the US, you're building kind of like innovative optimizations uh, on top of what kind of like already exists. And do you have something to say? Cool. Um, no, I just think, um, oh, sorry. Um, I just want to say that like Brian covered like a lot of details. So I just want to emphasize on the point that uh, Vietnam um, or like South Asia is very uh, market driven, where uh, US is very um, mi mission driven in terms of like the startup uh, and cooperation. Gotcha. So the mission. Uh always having to um, rally people over that mission that they're driving towards. Um, and, and Henry mentioned like in Southeast Asia, maybe more market driven um, and approaching opportunities in that way. Yeah. Cool. Um, related, um, moving on to the next question. What, what do folks think are the biggest either industries or opportunities in the Southeast Asia tech ecosystem? And I can actually like give my take here um, is uh, one of the biggest industries and trends, um, my opinion, is, is still fintech, um, where maybe in, in the US it's uh, a bit before and optimizations in the fintech world. Um, but my thesis is that, um, for example, coming from the Philippines, uh, so many people still unbanked, um, uh, so many uh, ways that we can still transact money and, and solve that problem of payments um, for small businesses. Uh, and my uh, take there is that if we can solve the problem of FinTech, it kind of lifts the boat for all these other small businesses or all, all other startups and, and uh, tech ecosystems to also thrive, um, but haven't gone there yet to the level of like the US where you know credit card transactions are automatic, uh, they can get money from the consumers really quickly and do that in a, an automated way, right? Um, uh, and, and I think a lot more innovation, a lot more things to be doing in, in the Southeast Asia uh, tech ecosystem for fintech that lifts all boats. Um, curious about people's takes and in industries and opportunities there. So uh, I can uh, talk about Vietnam. So I think uh, the top three industry right now is uh, payment, uh, retail uh, slash e-commerce, and uh, the third is the logistic. So 
Vietnam is uh, putting a lot of money into this uh, three industry, and there is some um, like potential winner. For example, payments, we have Momo and uh, Vampay. And for retails, and we have um, like Sando and Tiki and uh, logistics. There's like 40 current uh, startup like competing in this uh, market. So it's a uh, it's a lot of uh, competition for logistics right now. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so the question, if I remember properly, it was uh, what are some tech trends? going on in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think, you know, my answer with that to that would be, I had a guest on my podcast uh, who was the chief data officer of Gojek back in like 2017. And she's currently a VC up here in Silicon Valley. But uh, what she she had mentioned the three, the three trends um, that would be nice to take a look at were uh, content, commerce, and I think communications um, that, that she was seeing um, as a VC. So in terms of the content, you know, you think of TikTok and, you know, similar maybe social media things that are just being used widespread in the world like that. Um, but uh, I think that, um, you know, people are certainly making more content. So, you know, there's more people sharing short form video um, with uh, just the whole world, I, I guess, it's just <laughs> through uh, TikTok. Um, and, uh, but I think on the B2B side of that, there's, you know, an angle where businesses can change their content approach. I mean, um, uh, uh, just in general with, with more content being flooded into like the uh, people, you know, people's lives. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, just she also had mentioned that Gojek uh, at the time had uh, transacted more transact a million transactions a day, which is more than the Bank of Indonesia, and that just blew me away. You know, being here in the U.S. and just hearing news like that, like wow, there's a like that would be the equivalent of like Uber or Lyft having more transactions than like a I don't know like a J.P. Morgan or something like here, and uh, yeah, I think that there's so much room to run though with uh, startups um, in SEA just because. The markets aren't developed and they're in emerging markets, but you know, once you are able to take consumers away from what currently exists into a product that's a lot like 10 times better, then uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there, then there's your next big thing there, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I can just double down uh, on all of these. Um, FinTech is massive. Uh, it's incredibly hot right now in Southeast Asia. Uh, and like Mika, like you said, it's like 80 to 90% of most people don't have access to credit uh, in most countries. And so I think lending payments, et cetera, is just kind of like, I don't know, blowing up. Uh, probably one in every three or four companies that we look at in Southeast Asia is like a FinTech company. Uh, so lots of innovation happening there. Um, logistics, like Henry said, is like really, really big. Um, I think unlike the US, most, uh, most goods move through Southeast Asia. Uh, and so I think uh, like containers, trucking, et cetera, we're seeing tons and tons of that. Uh, Indonesia has cargo, right, um, which is really, really big. And I think every single major country has a really, really big port uh, that is like slowly being digitalized. So logistics is massive. Uh, like Dan said, um, you're seeing a lot of consumer kind of like mobile plays in Indonesia because um, the population is just like so big. <laughs> and uh, I think it's like the growth rate was like 65% uh, per year of people coming online again, like for the first time. And so consumer services, uh, lots of those being built in Indonesia. The last thing I would add is um, there are a lot of interesting marketplaces uh, coming up. And by marketplaces, I mean, um, you know how Uber is kind of like part-time driving? There's a lot of kind of like blue collar work uh, coming up in all these uh, different places. So people who are helping out in events or chefs or uh, cleanings, et cetera. Um, and, or uh, gig economy free, Lancer economy stuff uh, is really interesting. I think it's a lot of kind of like freeing the person up from doing full-time work and doing stuff on the side. Cause I think, I don't know, Asian people are such like hustlers. Uh, <laughs> I think all of those things are, are picking up and uh, it's becoming pretty hot, so. Cool. Um, my next question is 
kind of creative or uh, uh, wanting to get folks' takes on requests for startups in the Southeast Asia space. Um, so if you had a particular problem right now that you're encountering or, or, or a kind of a company that you think would be worth investing in or you'd be um, really interested in seeing out there, what would that be? And I, I can start with like a, a funny one um, is a, I think because of, you know, lots of folks being unbanked um, and not having credit cards um, or uh, in the Philippines, it's still a lot of cash transactions. It becomes very hard to send money over to my friend. A, there's no equivalent of Venmo. And so if there were a great way an easy way to transact um, peer to peer uh, back in the Philippines um, in Southeast Asia, similar to here using Venmo. That would be awesome. Yeah, that's that's a that's a cool trend. Um, I remember I met uh, a founder uh, or a COO of a company called Beam and Go. Have you guys ever heard of Beam and Go? I've heard of them. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I think uh, what they what they did or what I remember what the founder had mentioned to me. Uh, of what they do is uh, it's sort of like they give you store credit or like gift cards, but it's it can only be spent on store credit. And I just was fascinated because he had mentioned there's an issue, like a problem of uh, you send money to like a relative and they use it for like illegal stuff or like bad things. But he was like, no, yeah, this way they can only spend it on uh, on like 7-Eleven or like, uh, like uh, uh, Ayala Malls or something like that. So I guess that was cool. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, problems or things that can be solved through technology. I just don't know which uh, way to go about it. I mean, I had a friend of a friend who was trying to do like a ride share um, or like a, like Waze carpool, but for like the Philippines. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how like, but when I was in the Philippines, like eight years ago, like transportation, it was just, you know, the roads are obviously different. Like um, nobody, there's not really, like, there aren't strict traffic laws if if that's a good way to put it but uh yeah i mean maybe just moving people around through through like i guess there's grab already there but like something else other than grab like micro mobility or something like that yeah so um i think one of the problems that i'm uh seeing uh is um uh, Google Maps API or Google like uh, other like uh, uh, cloud services uh, data provider uh, costs a lot of money for the startup that in the logistic uh, industry because to pay for like uh, the, the the money for the API. So I was wondering like um, uh, if there is any future in the future any startup gonna start providing something like. Uh, Google Map API for the uh, logistics startup at a lower price. So I think they're going to save a lot of money and reduce a lot of costs if they can do that efficiently. So it's providing Google Map API uh, for the like, emerging market tech scene, uh, making sure that's also affordable. Yeah, exactly. Affordable uh, API is a uh, thing that that's a problem. Because I see a lot of startup complaining about like um, it's like it's very expensive to use uh, like the Google Map API when they need to do like routing and uh, destination and like, stuff like that. Brian. Uh, uh, okay, I'll give a boring one that we totally need, and then I'll give a fun <laughs> one. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so the boring one is, uh, so I'm a prop tech founder, right? I, I spent most of my time in real estate uh, and Southeast Asia doesn't have an MLS system. MLS is where like all the listings go up and you get data uh, on all of the kind of like homes. Uh, and so Southeast Asia can't build like Zillow, can't build Redfin, can't build Open Door, et cetera, just because there's no like data layer uh, on top of this. Um, and so I think some company needs to just like aggregate a bunch of data. Uh, and then provide it to other people. That's the boring one, but totally needs to be built. Be built. Okay, the good one. Uh, I don't know if it's good. Uh, I think I think Southeast Asia needs a better dating app because <laughs> I think there's just like a lot of people, and it's really really hard to find. I'm married. 
but I think about the NDFs all the time. Uh, there's just like a lot of people and it's really hard to find uh, like the right matches. And I think it's gonna look very different than like a Tinder or like a, I don't know, everything that's built in the US. Uh, I don't know what it's gonna look like, but I think that would be cool. The first thing that came to mind for me was um, Asia has really cool like reality TV shows, uh, like reality day TV shows. So maybe it's like a group setting, like online, you play games and then you, you then you like get matches. But I would love to see whoever's working on some dating app, please apply. Uh, I would love to fund these. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> that, that, that's funny, it becomes like a, a group social first and then you kind of like feel the air and see who you'd match with and, and yeah totally <laughs> totally <laughs> that's so funny um I, I actually also wanted to ask about the um mls mls what does it stand for uh mls is a mul multiple listing system uh multiple so system. yeah in the u.s like every brokerage they all like share data in southeast asia nobody shares data because yeah we all like competing with each other Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that, that's what I was gonna ask. Is what is what? Do you, what did you mean by the data layer um, that Southeast Asia would have? Okay, yeah. so someone could just aggregate everything. Um, then uh, these MLS. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, like oh. literally right now, if you want to go buy a house in Southeast Asia, you have to go talk to like ten brokerages. Right? There's no one place to go to be like, hey, I want to buy a house that's I don't know, two hundred thousand um, dollars. Interesting startup idea. Cool. All right. Um, re could be related to, uh, to some of the um, requests for startups, um, but any interesting startups in, in Southeast Asia that folks are, are bullish on? Um, uh, I am in particular, if anyone's heard of Paymongo, shout out to the team. Um, uh, they're doing really interesting stuff in um, the Philippines in, in FinTech, uh, making sure that uh, solving this whole fintech problem, helping small businesses and um, uh, all types of folks um, receive uh, the money that they need and, and get those payments. Um, and second one is Kumu. Uh, I was part of the early team at Kumu. Um, so shout out to the team as well. Um, but they're a live streaming app um, for the Philippine ecosystem. I'm doing really, really, really well right now. Um, so yeah, but what are folks... Um, uh, thoughts on interesting startups that they're bullish on. Um, in Vietnam, there is a SaaS uh, enterprise platform to manage the company and productivity of the employee and everything else. is It is called uh, base dot uh, Vietnam dot um, So it uh, is a B two B company and it's getting a lot of traction and I think it, it penetrate like a lot of the uh, enterprise uh, business. So I'm not uh, uh, I'm, I'm very certain that uh, maybe in the next uh, like five years I think this will cover like twenty or even like thirty percent of the Vietnam uh, enterprise. So yeah, based Doctor VM, that uh, that's a company. Cool. We uh, we funded twenty companies this year, and so it's really hard to pick my favorite. But I'll just mention <laughs> some. <laughs> so, uh, so Tendo Pay is the one that's in the Philippines for us. Uh, Tendo Pay is hmm. cool. They are like a firm, uh, basic. They're point of sale financing. So you go through Lazada uh, or something, right? And at the end, they're like, "Hey, uh, do you want to pay using installment loans uh, on on the product?" So you can pay over like twelve payments instead of. Uh, instead of immediately. So they're doing really well. Uh, I love them. Um, uh, the one that we recently, we have a new batch coming in January. So the one that I'm excited about right now is, um, is a credit card for freelancers. Uh, so freelancers are really hard to underwrite. They can usually not get credit cards um, because uh, they have unstable income, right? So one month you make a lot, then you don't make any. And then it's, it's the same thing that applies to gig workers. Uh, so the banks usually don't like uh, these folks and won't give them credit. Uh, and so that one's really interesting. Um, and then the third one I'll mention is um, it's a company called Spendmo. They just went through YC. We also uh, invested in them. 
Um, they are essentially helping companies uh, with uh, uh, credit card transactions, right? So if you're like a CFO internally, you need to know how much your accounting department is spending, product is spending, marketing is spending, uh, and it's now really hard to do. Uh, and so I think there are also really cool kind of like B2B uh, plays. Uh, and I totally didn't realize I did three fintech companies, but I will stop. There's, <laughs> there's, way, more, there's way more beyond fintech. <laughs> I was gonna say all fintech. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean that's a great question. What um, what companies do I see that are super, super interesting? Don't don't know too many, but uh, I guess Earl's company Plantina is uh, one that uh, seems really cool. Um, Introduced them to like a cool VC friend of mine. But uh, yeah, I mean in short, from my understanding, yeah, Plantina just went through a tech stars accelerator, and what they're doing is. Uh, Similar to a firm, but micro credit loans for uh, I think underbanked or unbanked individuals who can really use a credit score. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it'd be cool to like see like a IPO or like more M and A like news or something like that. Um, I guess Gojek is pretty mature now, like being like ten years old or like uh, Grab. So it'd be interesting to see what would happen if something ever went public from uh, the region. Um, yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Cool. All right. Um, next question, um, and we'll be wrapping up soon too. Um, curious what folks' thoughts are on what is missing um, in Southeast Asia's startup ecosystem. And you mentioned, right, like um, Brian had mentioned that uh, we're kind of like a version of Silicon Valley 10 years back. Um, and, and getting there and growing really quickly. Um, but what is missing to get to that point um, that can help accelerate the growth um, in Southeast Asia? That's that's a really good question. Yeah, I guess I'll just start first and see uh, how my thoughts uh, sound with other people from Southeast Asia who know it better than me. But uh, I think uh, from, from a venture capital perspective, it'd be interesting to learn about like the LP ecosystem or like how high net worth individuals or institutions in Southeast Asia, whether it's the Philippines or, you know, Vietnam or Singapore, I'm sure has a lot of uh, knowledge about the space, but I guess um, people starting more funds within the ecosystem or within the countries, right, would accelerate the the uh, the funding and, you know, sort of the culture of uh, innovation. Um, uh, or even more American funds just uh, putting dollars into the region would would probably make um the the growth quicker or just more noticeable um but yeah i, I you know uh other than like you know hearing about paymongo or like earl startup um which, which are both fintech it's it seems like uh uh there's there's different capital demands for from from uh it's going to, I mean, I guess it's just going to be a different, um, different fundraisers for, you know, different verticals, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think it is growing as, as, uh, as, um, I continue to, you know, meet more people from the region and, uh, learn, learn more things about how everything's developing. Um, but yeah, I, I think in short, just more LPs or funds in general, just, uh, looking to 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 support in the, the capital aspect. Um, so uh, in Vietnam, I think the, I think that the common answer is uh, infrastructure. So there's a lot of logistic company like driving around. Uh, so I think if we can build a, a better road for them, like a build better like a phone carrier service for them, uh, I think uh, that's going to help them a lot. Uh, I think the second one is uh, a legal and a copyright. Um, I'm, I, uh, um, in the future, um, I think Vietnam going to produce a lot of uh, uh, tech like pattern and uh, uh, like machine learning and AI uh, product, so I think uh, the the government should be able to protect uh, the, the copyright for those companies. That's gonna make uh, like um, 
the tech uh, startup uh, have a lot more confidence and put a lot more money into uh, their research. Okay. Uh, so I have a really strong opinion on this. <laughs> so, uh, or else I want to uh, Yes. I think I think the region just needs more like Cognity Labs. Uh, like literally the thing that's missing in the ecosystem is most, yeah, exactly. Uh, like <laughs> most, most founders are doing it for the first time. Right. And when I did it for the first time, uh, I had like no clue what I was doing. Uh, and it took me like a year to do something that I can now do in like a month. Right. And, uh, people are having a hard time. I think leaving, I, I talked to a ton of the Gojek execs and the like grab execs, et cetera. Like everyone's thinking about this, uh, this entrepreneurship thing, but they just haven't done it before. Right. And it's, it's really scary to like make the jump. Uh, and so I think what the, what the ecosystem needs is, um, strong operators, kind of like folks that have kind of like done, uh, the journey before to come in and kind of like help the ecosystem grow. Um, and I think, I think that's the special thing about the Bay Area, right? It's like you just walk down the street and you go to coffee and some there's like 50 other founders in the same coffee shop all struggling and making mistakes. And you're like, ah, I'm not alone. Uh, and so that's, yeah, I think that's what the ecosystem needs. And I'm glad, I'm glad Cognitive Labs is kind of like here uh, uh, to do this. Yay. <laughs> yeah, summarizing that, um, I'm, I'm hearing so more funding, uh, more capital being injected into the system. Um, Tanya, you mentioned uh, kind of the bucket of government support, um, so patents, legal infrastructure to make sure that founders are supported throughout the, the, the journey of founding a company. Um, and Brian uh, mentioning um, more of these strong operators or folks who've done it in the past, um, being able to inject that uh, into the ecosystem and also build communities around that, um, like Cognity Labs, um, and lots of other companies and um, uh, communities that are popping up around that space. Um, yeah, I think to add to what I think is interesting and missing um, is uh, the note of like, uh, it's, it's an evolving mindset. Um, uh, so I guess this is more, uh, an existential crisis, but I think um, once folks are um, more into that mindset of you know being able to take those risks and moving from corporate to this slightly riskier um, phase and, and starting their own thing um, and, and doing that in tech ecosystem, I think that uh, will we'll do waves uh, of change. Where I think like um, back home, a lot of my friends are still um, very much wanting to be uh, in corporate life, which is not to say bad, um, but I think a big shift in mindset to be able to make that jump. All right, um, we'll be wrapping up with a last question. Um, and this is more uh, like advice. Um, so think about um, either uh, someone from Silicon Valley wanting to understand and and inject themselves in the Southeast Asian ecosystem or for the flip side, someone in uh, uh, Southeast Asia um, wanting to make the jump to Silicon Valley, what's one piece of advice um, you'd, you'd tell them um, and share with them to, to easily make that jump? And, and you can choose both or either. Don't jump now. Don't spread the virus. Jump later. Um, <laughs> Good. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. We, we just like you guys, Cognitive Labs, uh, kind of like try to be a bridge, right? So if you're interested in Southeast Asia, just reach out. We have 20 companies at least um and if you're a operator or a mentor or something or you're just like wanting to get uh i don't know plugged in uh we can certainly help uh the other way is um interesting because i don't know i i try to get more people from bay area to southeast asia than the reverse uh, but i think the i think if you're thinking about it the other way uh 
I think the advice is um, unlike uh, unlike Southeast Asia, I think the Bay Area is really open uh, to helping, uh, and I think that's the thing that's cool. Um, and so when you get here, just don't be afraid to ask for help because everyone's everyone's making mistakes and everyone's learning together. Henry, Dan? Um, yeah, I guess I'll try to take a stab at it. Uh, yeah, you know, I was talking to a VC, um, that's a global VC, a few weeks ago, and she was saying that she sees a lot of people coming back to the region from, I don't know, Ivy League schools or uh, just successful corporates here to go back and either try to create something or build something um, over there. but. It seems like the harder thing to do would be to go from the Southeast Asia region. Well, I guess I don't I don't know which one would be harder. I, I can't really answer that. But it, to me, it seems like going from the SEA region to Silicon Valley might be a little bit more intimidating just because there's like a different jargon here um, in terms of like raising money or like uh, uh, just different operation operating styles. I remember I, I spoke to... Uh, a friend of, or, or we had a guest on our podcast who who uh, launched a startup in India, not Southeast Asia, but he was saying that, you know, the approach in the valley is more product driven, while in Southeast or with, with in India or Asia maybe, it's more throw more people at, uh, throw more warm bodies at issue, issues, and maybe um, uh, what I would say my best advice would be just to keep the. Uh, keep the uh, culture that you're bringing into the region strong, whether that's, um, you know, the, the vision and like the mission, just keep, make sure that, that that's, uh, you know, aligned and, and uh, sturdy. If you're coming into the U.S. to, to uh, help uh, to further grow your company. But if you're going into the SCA region and, you spent some time in the Valley or uh, the U.S. in general. I think uh, I don't know. Just keep an open mind, and I think that uh, that that uh, there that uh, entrepreneurship is is good, no matter where you do it, and that uh, uh, the market's the ultimate judge, or like you know your your products the 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 thing maybe you can most focus on, and and uh, after that it's. Uh, it's, it's always good to get that out of the way. So, yeah, I guess just one one step at a time. You know, crawl before you could walk and walk before you could run. Cool, Henry. Um, yeah. So my advice is, uh, I think that moving from uh, like uh, C to uh, US, I think it's easier because, like Brian mentioned, uh, I think there's a lot more uh, mentor, advisor, and this. It's a big, big community of entrepreneurship in here. So I think uh, you can get a lot of help easily. Uh, but moving from US to C, I think, uh, uh, I think yeah, we have to adjust to the, uh, to the culture. I think it's very, very different. So um, yeah, if, you, uh, if, if I'm gonna go back to Vietnam right now in Quoc, I think I have to take me at least like six months to a year to <laughs> adjust my expectation because the Vietnam that I know when I left 10 years ago is totally different. I came back home like uh, two years ago and my entire, the, the road around my house, the bridge and everything is in the people are just so different. So I think the adjust the salary, the people, the communication, like the way everything is, is going to be, uh, need to be adjusted. Agree. Yeah, culture shock in both ways. Cool. That about wraps it up for our panel. Thank you, Henry, Dan, and Brian for joining us. Um, and, and to end, just quick plugs. Um, listen to the Startup Mindsets podcast. You'll hear from Dan and <laughs> Earl. Um, uh, talk to Iterative. If you're starting a company in Southeast Asia, they fund really great startups. And you can see uh, iterative.vc for more info. Um, and lastly, check out cognitivelabs.com, bridging Silicon Valley to Southeast Asia. Um, we're uh, 
starting our new cohort very soon, um, but we're always on the lookout for really cool startups in the region. Um, thanks everyone for joining uh, and thanks for watching us. Cool, yeah, peace. Take care.